Well, I'm Pat Lynch. Thanks very much, Tuan, for the um, introduction. And I'm going to talk about how I create uh, the field guide books that I do. It's uh, now an entirely digital process, uh, but I've been doing this, uh, well, I was at Yale for 45 years, uh, doing various kinds of photography and illustration and um, uh, transitioned from traditional, mostly watercolor media once upon a time to uh, now it's entirely digital illustrations in Photoshop. And although in my day job, I mostly did medical things, a few biological things, uh, but I've been um, passionately interested in birds and wildlife and natural history uh, since at least the early 70s. And uh, so in a sort of parallel, I've done a lot of natural history things over the years. Um, I've been a biomedical illustrator. I have done a lot of photography. I'm not going to talk a lot about photography here because um, people are often mystified about how I create my artwork. But thanks to cell phones especially, almost everybody has some notion of digital photography. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that. And I've done software and obviously I write and, and, and I've produced a lot of videos. So um, uh, it's either a checkered career or master of none, depending. Um, and, um, and now I do everything in Photoshop. Uh, Great Horned Owl here is, is a Photoshop illustration. Uh, but um, as I'll explain, uh, what I do in Photoshop is really not that different than what I used to do in watercolor. Uh, this is a gouache painting of a gear falcon I did um, back in the Pleistocene. Uh, 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 gouache is um, the artist term for opaque watercolor. That is, it's white paint, um, uh, not the white of the board. And that's what I did all my fancy medical illustrations and, and many of the earliest bird illustrations that I did. So these are all watercolor um, in fairly traditional um, media. And um, uh, I was very active in the Association of Medical Illustrators for many years and whatnot. And, and although there are some illustrators who, uh, mostly editorial illustrators, who still like to use a lot of traditional media, virtually all of my peers have long since moved on to digital media and nobody misses it. I certainly don't miss um, Kodachrome. And the only thing I missed about Kodachrome is it had a really interesting creamy smell when you popped open the plastic caps. <laughs> but other than that, boy, am I glad to see all of this stuff go away. I, you know, um, uh, uh, glommed onto digital photography as soon as the cameras became uh, reasonably affordable and never looked back. I don't know any of my photographer friends who've missed a dark room for, you know, two seconds. Uh, and it used to be a whole lot harder to do what I, it literally took rooms full of equipment to do the kind of range of media I, uh, I used to do back in the 70s and 80s with stuff like this. Um, oh, I just noticed the ashtray. This was a long time ago. Um, and now all of this stuff has collapsed down into my shiny little uh, iMac. Um, my real setup is nowhere near this neat. Um, in, in marketing, they never show you cords and things. This is what my setup really looks like. It's the same machine, um, uh, double monitors, and, and I'll explain some of the things I do as I go along. But what's remarkable over the course of my career is that now I do uh, things a whole lot faster, a whole lot better with um, a much, much wider range of capabilities on a one machine plus a couple of cameras and a few other peripherals that I'll explain. As I said, uh, what I do in Photoshop is not that different than what I used to do in watercolor. And people who are not familiar with digital illustration might think that Photoshop is doing something magical for me here. Um, there is no filter for draw a nice bird. Um, it, 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 um, every line that you see here was drawn by me by hand with a graphics tablet, as I'll show you in a minute. And 
Um, and in that sense, what I'm doing now is not that different than what I used to do with very fine paint brushes, sable brushes, and watercolor years ago. I use a graphics tablet. Um, uh, there are various kinds of graphics tablets now, including ones that actually are monitors, that is, that show you a picture right on the tablet. Uh, I've been drawing in one place and while looking at another for, oh, I don't know, more than 20 years at least. And so I'm used to working this way. So I, I uh, have a, a fairly large tablet. It's about a 14 by 12 tablet. Uh, because it's much easier to draw um, uh, that way than than the smaller, more affordable tablets. It's they're not that different in terms of that technology. But in art school, one of the first things you learn is that you draw not with your fingers or with your hand. You want to draw in sweeping motions with your whole arm, and a larger tablet makes that possible. I uh, have a pressure sensitive stylus. It looks like a pen except that it costs $75, which is ridiculous, but you know, it's a razors and blades thing. If you have Wacom tablets, you have to pay them for the stylus. Um, the glove um, and the dustiness that you see is, is cornstarch. And um, it's because, especially in the humid times of year, but really any time of year, I can spend all day, every day for long periods, essentially rubbing my hand on a giant sheet of plastic which um, builds up friction. So I use the cornstarch and the half glove to um, make my movements over the, the tablet as smooth as possible. The uh, pressure sensitive stylus is very, very sensitive. Um, I can do virtually anything I wanna do with it, um, pressing down hard to get big effects and drawing very softly for, for small. These are, um, uh, uh, made by the same Intuos or, or Wacom company, um, uh, where the, uh, the tablet has a built-in monitor. They're very much more expensive than what I do. I, um, after decades of drawing it the other way, I found them, well, I didn't find any advantage to using them. So I still use um, the plain graphics tablet. Um, and to the extent that there's anything magical about digital media and particularly Photoshop where I do all my illustrations, it has nothing to do with automated ways of drawing anything really. Um, these are all, as I said, every stroke that you see on the screen uh, was put there by me with the stylus. Uh, the magic of digital uh, illustration are, are two things. One is undo. And everybody uses, who, who uses computers understands undo. I can work very, very fast now. I can probably do this in a third, even sometimes a quarter of the time it would take me in conventional watercolor and do it better uh, because I'm using Photoshop and I can work very, very quickly. And I don't have to worry, especially when I'm days into a particularly complex illustration, I don't have to worry about messing things up. I save multiple versions of what I'm working on and I can always hit undo. So I can scribble very fast and very loosely and I don't have to worry about messing things up. So that's an enormous advantage of digital media. I'm not gonna break anything. I'm not gonna mess up anything. Uh, in the old days with a complex watercolor illustration, you know, I might make work a week on something and believe me, by the end of a week, you're working very slowly and very carefully because you don't wanna mess anything up. And none of that is true in Photoshop. I just work really fast, very loosely. I'm essentially scribbling away, doing things. I try something. If I don't like the way it looks, I just hit undo. So um, it's fast that way. I thought I would walk quickly through a sort of process of how a bird illustration comes into existence here. Um, uh, it's not that mysterious. Um, it, it's sort of conceptually pretty similar to what I used to do in, in watercolor. Uh, um, aside from a very, very careful outline drawing, which I still do on a conventional drawing board with a pencil. That's something that um, I've, I uh, I've just still even decades into this, 
much more comfortable getting the exact lines and proportions and whatnot with uh, tracing paper and a mechanical pencil working on a drawing board. Once I've got that, I scan it into Photoshop. And the first thing I do is do a very rough uh, kind of uh, shaded painting of the bird. Because first and foremost, uh, a bird is a three-dimensional object in space. And so I wanna capture some of that three-dimensionality before I get obsessed with all the feather detail. And then I start layering in uh, uh, various amounts of detail. And as I'll explain in a minute about Photoshop and layers, each one of these steps is on a separate layer. I can undo them very quickly if I want to. I can modify those layers. I don't save a lot of layers, um, and, and I'll explain that um, a little bit more uh, uh, when I'm showing you fish and other things. Um, I don't save a lot of layers when I'm working in birds, but I use temporary layers all the time. And again, um, in addition to undo, it gives me lots of speed in getting things done here. Um, here, finally, there's a, a photograph of um, a, a local park in the background, uh, salt marsh um, uh, to go with the Northern Harrier. Um, and um, it's like the other things, it's, it's I don't know whether, I don't obsess about whether it's a painting or a drawing, but um, it's, it's especially for fur and feathers, a very linear sort of process here you can see close up. So layers is the other magic thing in addition to undo. And uh, you can think of layers as almost like um, the old fashioned biology books where they might show you the anatomy of the frog and there would be transparent sheets that you could lay uh, over uh, the, the various things so that, so that the sheer complexity of all the anatomy wasn't overwhelming. And a Photoshop is like that. I can make virtual layers and what happens on one layer is completely independent of another. So uh, I, if I mess something up uh, on, on say the base layer, um, uh, I can, uh, or, or if I wanna start adding detail, but I'm, uh, but I'm happy with the base layer that you see here, um, I make a separate layer and then I move on to another layer and add more detail. All of the details that you see in, in the fish that just came on this layer too are completely independent of, um, uh, uh, of what I did on the first layer. And, um, and now, oops, sorry, here. And uh, this will be the final layer. Um, I've simplified things here into three layers uh, showing you the various linear details and, and fine shadings and things. I don't do um, multi layers on uh, birds and things because I find the coloration and whatnot usually a lot more straightforward. But with these small freshwater fish, they are so variable in, in their coloration, even moment to moment, they can at will change their colors and, and shades and whatnot that I want the kind of control that layering gives me. And um, in this particular case, I don't know, I think I had something like uh, 11 or 12 different layers here. And I preserve those because as I'll show you in a second, it gives me tremendous flexibility. Here's another layered version of a pumpkin seed fish. And each step here is, is on a separate layer. So if I draw in the pumpkin seed spots and they're a little too orange or a little too red or a little too bright or a little too dark. Um, I can adjust each different layer independently. I can make the spots lighter or darker. Um, I can make them various uh, degrees of transparent. Uh, here on another layer, I've added in the scales and, and um, I don't know if there's any ichthyologists in the audience, but life is too short to draw scales by hand. Um, I, I drew a long time ago on Adobe Illustrator uh, um, uh, various kinds of fish scale patterns and I tend to bring them in and they look a little bit mechanical, but um, uh, I just can't spend an extra week working on layers by hand or, or scales by hand. And uh, uh, here, for example, the shininess of the fish, 
is completely independent of everything else I've done. So layers gives me tremendous flexibility. Um, I, I hopefully this will come through on the screen, the subtleties here. Here's uh, another sunfish. Um, it's very often, uh, say I'll show it to a friend and, and he or she might say, well, the stripes maybe don't look as light as they should or as dark as they should, or the speckling is more than they're used to seeing. And so the layers, because I preserve them, give me tremendous flexibility. Here I've lightened up the stripes or um, here I've darkened them. Uh, here I've desaturated the colors a little bit on, the, on some of the base coloring illustration if they, if I'm afraid that the colors look too hot. And that kind of subtlety is tremendous. Here finally is the pumpkin seed um, inserted into a, a larger plate uh, 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 page spread that I did for my Cape Cod guide. And each one of these fish species is illustrated in a separate file. And then I bring them all together finally. I, I know roughly what I'm aiming for when I do the illustrations. Uh, but I do them independently and then I bring them all together in, in a final plate. Uh, here's a um, brown pelican, one of my favorite birds. I, uh, uh, again, the speed at which I can work because I'm not worried about messing something up is a tremendous advantage. I don't save a lot of layers with my birds, uh, but I use uh, a lot of temporary layers uh, when I'm working and I'll hopefully explain a little bit of that. <laughs> this illustration always reminds me of an old King Crimson album cover <laughs> because of the same colors. But anyway, um, the first thing I do when I'm working on an animal is I draw the eye. And if the eye doesn't have that spark of liveliness, then uh, the rest, whatever else I do, isn't going to work that well. And when I'm working on something very detailed like the eye, uh, I may have as many as a dozen different layers uh, at the same time. Uh, the pupil, the iris, the details of the iris, the details around the edges of the cornea where it meets the eyelids, the, uh, the, the reflection of the sky in the very shiny eye, the uh, white specular highlights, they're all on different layers. Once I've got what I want, I collapse them all down um, and, and uh, uh, I, I don't save the individual layers. At some point, if I saved uh, you know, dozens of layers of every part of an illustration, um, these files are hundreds of megabytes and they would just get absurdly large and it would slow the process down. Um, each one of these birds, for example, was done as a separate illustration file. I knew roughly what I was aiming at um, when I, uh, um, and then finally I assemble them together. This is a horizontal plate I did for, oh, I think um, the mid, uh, the mid Atlantic guide, um, all separate illustrations. Some, a couple of these illustrations are 20 years old, uh, mixed and matched with things I did just a year or two ago, um, all in Photoshop. And, I remember being fascinated. I, I was lucky enough to meet Roger Peterson a number of different times and go to his studio in Old Lyme, Connecticut, which is um, only about 40 minutes from where I live. And um, he described the process he had of putting together plates. I've always, you know, just loved his Mexican bird plates, most of all. They're such, uh, they're so beautifully done and all the birds are interwoven so, so interestingly. And he um, showed me his essentially kind of paper doll process for doing these things in traditional watercolor. The birds all overlap, you know, just in a certain way. And, but he did it very carefully because once he committed to that design, he was stuck with it essentially. Um, I think, in, especially in the case of um, his uh, field guide plates, they were masterpieces, but nevertheless, he could not easily change a design. He'd have to repaint it. Whereas um, in my birds, uh, the whole bird is there where they overlap. So um, each one of these things was painted differently. The, the little blue heron is, is, um, was originally painted in a different file from the great blue heron, et cetera. 
Um, I can mix and match the layers if I want. I can shuffle things around very easily. And in this particular plate was done as a two page spread for my Mid-Atlantic guide, but I'm working on a, um, on a Connecticut River guide and uh, I needed to rearrange everything into a vertical plate. And that was you know, incredibly easy without, um, I think it maybe took me 15, 20 minutes maximum to take this plate and rearrange it as a vertical layout. Um, and that's the power of digital media. I can do those things so flexibly. And um, all, uh, birds and bird illustration are my first love. I, I just love doing other kinds of, of creatures as well. And the, the field guides require them. I just, I did a whole series of butterflies a couple of years ago and just thoroughly enjoyed the experience. Um, for, the, for the Connecticut River Guide, I wanted to do some of the canids of New England. And so I have, uh, um, in this case, um, the, the Eastern Coyote. And uh, it's, it's, again, the very linear things is um, a, a texture of fur is just perfectly suited to the way I use Photoshop. And so here are some of the details, the gray fox on the left and red fox on the right. And uh, I, these are separate files, separate paintings. I knew roughly what I wanted to do um, and, and brought the sketches together in a kind of conceptual way. So uh, uh, to, uh, I knew what the final plate roughly uh, I wanted it to look like, but I did the individual paintings separately and then brought them in together. Um, unfortunately, the, the Eastern Gray Wolf is largely extirpated in, in uh, New England. It's coming into Northern Maine and, and the very parts of the sort of Northern Kingdom, as they call it, of New England. Uh, but um, uh, uh, I wanted to represent it there because historically it was an enormously important predator uh, in the ecology of New England. So these, this is the final spread. Um, it's a little bit cramped. I wanted to get it into slide format instead of book format. So the, um, and one of the things I can do is, of course, I didn't paint the wolf transparently. I uh, painted it. Um, uh, in, in full opacity, but uh, because the wolf is still largely extirpated, I wanted to ghost it into the background, refer to it, but also to have it look very different than the current canid species. And that was, uh, I'd say trivial to do, but almost if you're used to working in Photoshop. And I, you know, if, if for some reason or another, I decide that this has to be a vertical plate, I can shuffle it around and 15 minutes later, it'll be a vertical plate. Uh, I, in writing my um, field guides, I feel very passionately that the, one of the things I can contribute is not just the what, that is labeled illustrations of bugs and plants and birds and things, but um, I, I want my guides to be, uh, to convey a sense of the ecology and the history of a place so that when you walk into a mid-Atlantic salt marsh and whatnot, you have not only a sense of, of the common things that you might see, but uh, uh, hopefully a deeper sense of why things are the way they are. And so I've gotten really into geology over the course of the field guides that I've done. This is a view of the mid-Atlantic coast 25,000 years ago when the sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today. Uh, the sea level was very much lower because so much of the Earth's water was bound up in the ice caps at the uh, uh, peak of the Wisconsin and glaciation, which is 25,000 years ago. And so the, um, the, the whole of the continental shelf um, off the uh, um, uh, mid-Atlantic coast, whoops, my mouse gets a little funky sometimes when I try to use it as a pointer. Um, this whole section, uh, which is now underwater, the continental shelf was dry land. So I just love doing these geology illustrations. The light green is the modern coastline. And it explains a lot of the offshore canyons and things like that. Um, if you know what the history was, the canyons didn't come from nowhere. They used to be the rivers when the rivers flowed all the way to the edge of the continental shelf. So, um, 
So that's the illustration. And the other sort of magical part for me, because I'm both writing the book and illustrating it, is that uh, even sometimes um, at, a, at relatively early stages, I'm able to take something and lay it out very quickly in uh, an Adobe program called InDesign, which allows me to lay out the whole book. Uh, um, I can see the text, I can mix and match the text and captions and illustrations. And it's just, I, I, I've done this for all my books, going back to, you know, PageMaker 1.0 in the ornithology lab manual that I did, uh, which was my first book. And, um, and I, uh, I can't imagine just taking my double spaced manuscript and my pile of illustrations and photographs and handing them over to a publisher and hoping things come out well. It would, it would just be a terrible process, uh, both for me and for the publisher, because I know what I have in mind and, um, uh, and I can do it. Uh, and it's a very interactive process. I knew, for example, in writing the Cape Cod Guide that I wanted to address the great white shark um, and the gray seals and how the two populations interact. And I created this play long before the chapter was done, but in my mind's eye, uh, I was able to put together a, a several different photographs and an illustration and imagine it uh, at first, you know, sort of in my mind's eye, but but literally plug it into the layout of the book and see what it would look like uh, long before the rest of the book existed. Uh, so it's a tremendous advantage to be able to do these layouts. And it gives me incredible flexibility because there's a physical limit to a book. I have 480 pages, including the front matter and the back matter, the index and credits and all that stuff. And I'm able to use every single page to the maximum because I know how it's all gonna lay out. I know what my limits are. Um, if you don't know anything about book publishing or printing really, um, uh, books are printed in 16 page signatures. So I have a certain number of signatures that adds up to 480 pages and I cannot have 481 pages. 481 pages would require another 16 page signature and that would alter the economics of the publishing and whatnot. So um, InDesign allows me to, to know in advance, even in the unedited manuscript that I hand over to Yale Press is essentially a whole bunch of Photoshop files, whole bunch of digital photos, uh, maps, et cetera, diagrams, and uh, uh, and and um, it is edited in InDesign by Laura Dooley, my longtime editor, and so she's actually working in InDesign as well. So um, you know, to a layman, it might look as if the book was done, uh, the unedited book was done because it's all laid out and everything. Um, far from it. Um, uh, uh, editors add enormous value. Uh, and things way, way beyond trivial stuff, like whether things are spelled correctly or not. Um, and so the whole process is digital, both on my side and on their side. And and I even do the covers myself. Um, this is a layout for the Mid-Atlantic Guide. And um, uh, we're, uh, this is a series of field guides. So the cover format um, is largely already determined um, and uh, I plug in the various new uh, text and illustrations and whatnot um, with the idea that I want it to look like the Long Island Sound Guide and the Cape Cod Guide and, um, and the new Connecticut Coast Guide will have the same sort of thing. And so I've never looked back with digital illustration. It's always been um, uh, uh, just a joy to work on stuff. Uh, uh, these are, you know, in my humble opinion, far, far better than anything I was able to do in watercolor years ago. I can do them faster and more flexibly. And I've just never looked back. These are tree swallows. It's a big phenomenon on the Connecticut River, these massive gatherings of tree swallows. So, um, 
And I still do, not as anywhere near as much as I'd like to, I still use conventional media. These are colored pencil drawings. As you can see, my barn owl doesn't look that different than what I would have done in Photoshop, except that you know I've uh, done a quick drawing on paper using colored pencils, uh, at which I do still to work out design ideas and just for, Sometimes I just miss the pleasure, the manual dexterity, crafty pleasure of working with my hands. And, uh, and for that reason, I still do nowhere near as much as I'd like to, but I still do oil paintings. Uh, for example, here's uh, the, the um, uh, Cape Cod view. These are eiders out in the surf in Maine. Um, uh, Hammonasset State Park, which Tron knows well, and um, a quick painting of Milford Point, another place Tuan knows well uh, from his time in Connecticut. So that's what I do. Thanks very much for your time. I'd be happy to back up if you have specific questions about things and, um, uh, and happy to answer any questions you might have.